pleasure and it's an honor to introduce Walter Williams, who I think is one of the great contributors to freedom and libertarianism in the world. Uh, any of you that haven't read his uh, book should do so. And the contribution to Siskai, I should mention, is that he was one of the people that planted some of the seeds that are now germinating, and he planted seeds that are very hard to resist, uh, as you'll see now. And I'm sure that uh, those seeds have germinated, and I hope will continue germinating. And so let us hear from Walter the kind of eloquence that has uh, increased the freedom of at least two million people in Africa as of today. Walter. This is on. Okay. Thank you very much. And I would like to say that uh, I'm very happy that you invited me to the Libertarian International. And uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that I'm going to say uh, that perhaps even as Libertarians you might not have heard them or, or they might uh, <clears throat> test your Libertarian values. So uh, to the extent that I might say something that you don't understand or that you disagree with, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, feel free to raise questions or comments or, or uh, and you don't have to show me any undue courtesy because I'm your guest, uh, just give me a hard time, uh, but keep in mind at the same time I have a black belt in karate, I'm very <coughs> proficient at defending myself. Uh, <coughs> when I was invited to the conference, I didn't go to any great lengths. Uh, I'm going to talk about minorities and, and uh, unemployment. But I didn't go to any great lengths to study the institutions of uh, the United Kingdom and the various laws here uh, regarding uh, employment. And I did that because I kind of figure as a physicist, if you had invited me as a physicist, uh, I, you know, and I'm a kind of expert in gravity as a physicist, I probably wouldn't have, not have to worry about uh, whether gravity was any different uh, uh, in the UK uh, as opposed to the United States. So I believe that there are some general principles of supply and demand that apply um, uh, everywhere in the world. Um, I think that some of the things that we have to say about the problems of... Uh, before I talk about that, I would like to say that the next time you invite me, I think uh, rather than talking about unemployment and uh, minorities, I would much rather give a, a lecture on, uh, on uh, government intervention and individual freedom. That's a much better lecture, in my opinion, because um, I talk about rape and, and seduction and all these other kinds of uh, uh, things that you want to know about. But, be that as may, I was given uh, instructions to talk about minority uh, unemployment. <clears throat> I think that there are several hypotheses that are used to explain the problems that uh, minorities face. One is, uh, has to do with preferences. People say that, well, minorities are worse off because uh, white people like them less. And that explains uh, their problems. There's another hypothesis uh, that people use, uh, and that has to do with um, uh, collusions. People say that uh, there's some kind of conspiracy uh, against minorities. And that explains uh, their problems of poverty and, and unemployment. And some people say that good and evil explains it. That is. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, minorities have problems because they're evil people out there and we have to go out and find the evil pe people and then punish them and then everything will be all right. Now, <clears throat> what's wrong with these approaches to the problems that uh, minorities face? Well, I think the good and evil one is the uh, easiest one to uh, dispense with and, uh, and uh, I don't think that we can explain very much in this world in terms of good and evil. Uh, because it appears to me that uh, uh, men have been evil uh, at all places and all times, but we find different outcomes in different uh, places and at different times, and if good and evil could explain things, as well as people uh, suggest that it might explain, uh, 
uh, we would find a little more consistency with respect to the outcomes. Well, what about the second hypothesis uh, that people use to explain the plight of minorities? And before I talk about the second hypothesis, uh, even to use the term minorities, particularly, particularly in the United States, to explain the problems that uh, people face, uh, <clears throat> uh, to use the term minorities is very misleading because in the United States, at least, we're a nation of minorities. Um, <clears throat> that is, the largest ethnic group in the United States uh, are people of uh, English ancestry, which constitute about 15% of the population. Uh, the next largest ethnic group are people of uh, German uh, ancestry, which are around 14% of the population. And then come uh, black Americans, which constitute about 12% of the population. Then you have Poles, Jews, uh, uh, Arabs, Italians, Armenians, Chinese, Japanese, etc., etc. After that, so we're a nation of minorities. Now, when you use the term minority, you somehow imply that there's a majority, but it turns out that we don't have much of a majority in the United States. Sometimes when I talk to my wife's family, uh, I tell them that if they would work a little bit harder, blacks could be a majority uh, in the United States. Um, <clears throat> they have a lot of children, those people. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Getting back to preferences, what's wrong with explaining things through saying that people uh, uh, dislike blacks and, or dislike particular minorities, and that explains their plight? Well, I argue that, and, and, good, and if you're a good economist, you would say that <clears throat> preferences alone just cannot explain very much of human behavior, um, because preferences, or what people like and what they dislike, uh, ignores the fact that there are constraints on human behavior. We just can't have all of what we like. Uh, there are some constraints. For example, <clears throat> if you did a survey at, around London or in the United States and you asked people, which do they like the most, Rolls Royces or Pintos? I'm quite sure people would say, well, I like Rolls Royces better than Pintos. Uh, which do you like the most, filet mignon or chuck steak? Everybody would probably say, well, I like filet mignon uh, the most. Or which do you like the most, uh, uh, <clears throat> Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine or Annie Greenspring's wine? Uh, people would probably say uh, Lafitte Rothschild. Now, having done such a survey, you go out and find out what do people actually do. You go and look in their cupboards and lo or look in uh, their garages. And any day of the week, you'd find that Pintos outsell Rolls Royces. Uh, a chuck steak outsells filet mignon, and uh, Annie Green Springs wine outsells Lafitte Rothschild. Now, this, despite the fact that people say they like the other better. Now, but when you try to explain things according to likes and dislikes or preferences, uh, you ignore the fact that people's behavior is constrained. That is, you must take into account prices and income which represent constraints on human behavior. That is, people just can't take all that they want, or can't have all that they want. And there's something known as a downward sloping demand curve, which suggests that the higher the price of something, the less people take of something, or any object of desire, and the lower the price, the more people take of it. So we have to, if we want to look at human behavior, if we want to get a good grasp of human behavior, we have to look at the costs involved with different courses of action. Now, let me give you a racial example of this. Uh, consider a man like Governor Wallace. Uh, now, let's assume that Go Governor, Wall Governor Wallace is a man that got a reputation for standing in the school door back in uh, 1959 or so uh, to prevent blacks from getting in, for those of you who haven't heard of our prestigious governor. But let's assume a man like Governor Wallace does not like blacks. I don't know whether he likes blacks or not. But let's just assume it for argument's sake and for simplicity. Now, suppose uh, we're in Vietnam, Governor Wallace and I in Vietnam. He doesn't like blacks. You know, in, in civilian life, he would go to considerable lengths to avoid physical proximity with me. Like at a theater, he might go sit on the other side of the theater. Or at a party, he might go to the other side of the room. At a restaurant, he might want to sit in the front and leave me in the back and things like that. But consider that Governor Wallace and I are on the battlefields of Vietnam. And the bullets and bombs are flying. And here I am in the foxhole. I have, I'm undercover, and Governor Wallace is running around looking for cover. Now, <clears throat> now, do you think that he would get up this foxhole and say, oops, there's Williams, let me go find another foxhole? <laughs> well, 
Well, probably he wouldn't. Now, how do you explain Governor Wallace's behavior? Well, if you listen to many people, uh, you, would ha you would believe that Governor Wallace likes blacks under battlefield conditions, and he dislikes blacks under non-battlefield conditions, because clearly he would jump into the foxhole. Now, but however, as an economist, if you consider costs of behavior, you would explain his behavior by saying, well, the cost of, phys of avoiding physical proximity with Williams has risen, and Governor Wallace takes less of it. And that is the hypothesis of the downward sloping demand curve. So, again, uh, preferences alone just cannot explain human behavior, because preferences alone ignore the fact that there are constraints on human behavior. And for those of you who have taken an intermediate course in economics, uh, you know that if you draw a preference curve or an indifference map just alone between two goods, you know that it will not tell you how much a person will take of it. You need some kind of constraint on his behavior. Now, <clears throat> what about collective conspiracies as an explanation to the problems that blacks face or that minorities face? face if you want to use that term. And some people, when they start talking about collective conspiracies, they almost say that white people have a meeting every night, and, they, uh, and, and during this course's meeting, they decide how to victimize blacks the next day. Or if you're talking about sexual discrimination, you know, men have a meeting every night uh, to discover ways to victimize women uh, and to trick them into working for low pay and things like that the next day. Now. What's wrong with collective conspiracy, the collective conspiracy hypothesis in terms of explaining human behavior? Well, basically, what's wrong with it is that the collective conspiracy hypothesis ignores the fact that <clears throat> the attainment of one man's goal, or to be more modern, I'm still fashioned to the attainment of one person's goal, uh, may make impossible the attainment of another person's goal. Uh, consider the following example. I normally like to have a blackboard for this example, but I don't have one, so you have to visualize it. Uh, consider that you have a neighborhood, a neighborhood of white people, and, uh, and they have a meeting one night, and they say, well, look, we're, go we're, we're going to agree among ourselves. We're going to have a gentleman's agreement not to sell our homes to blacks. And you have Mr. A, B, C, D, and so forth, and they all agree. And let's say that Mr. A gets a job, and he's going to move to California, and the going prices of houses in that neighborhood is around $40,000. And suppose a black comes along and offers Mr. A $60,000 for his house. Immediately, in Mr. A's mind, is a conflict. That is, he says, shall I abide by the agreement with my neighbors, or shall I take the extra $20,000 and go? Now, of course, gentlemen's agreements also conform to the first fundamental law of demand. That is, when the cost of gentlemen's agreements are low, then people will be more gentlemanly. Uh, <laughs> but when they're high, they'll be less uh, 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 gentlemanly. Now, so immediately, we recognize that the cost of abiding by his agreement with his neighbors is $20,000, namely a differential between 40 and 60 that the black has uh, offered him. Considerable evidence suggests that Mr. A will take the uh, $60,000 and run. And some of that ad evidence is that the fact that in some places, and in the United States, we used to have restrictive covenant laws, that is, laws that prohibit the sale of, uh, of houses in certain neighborhoods to blacks, Jews, and Orientals. Now, whenever you see a law, your first suspicion is that should be that that law is on the book because somebody would behave differently than the law specifies. That is, if white people could be trusted among them, so if they could trust one another, you would not need a law because they just wouldn't sell their house to a black. So the existence of law suggests that many uh, 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 whites would uh, uh, ignore the gentleman's agreement. And perhaps some more evidence, although it's indirect, is that if you come to some cities in uh, in uh, uh, like Philadelphia, Detroit, and Chicago, and, and possibly cities in the uh, UK, you might have seen that 
Even during relatively racial, racially hostile times, you could not prevent whole neighborhoods from going from white to black virtually overnight. Now, you should ask yourself, well, how did blacks, poor people, uh, uh, seize the use control of that property? How'd they come to take it away, to get whites out? Well, essentially, they broke down whatever conspiracy there might have been through the market mechanism. That is, uh, they just simply outbidded whites for the land. And you can see this if you imagine some of these buildings, uh, uh, let's say like in New York, they're three-story brownstone buildings, and there might have been a three-story building uh, being rented by a white family. Let's say they were paying uh, $200 a month. Now, possibly what six black families came up to the landlord and said, well, look, why don't you cut that building up into six parts and we'll pay you $75 for each part. And the landlord, looking at the potential profits, he probably said to himself, well, look, I don't, I don't hate blacks that much. And so the, the whites left. And, of course, uh, when they went out to the suburbs, uh, the people got tired of the operation of the free market, so they made all kinds of laws that said, well, in order to live in a house or to buy a house that has to be 3,000 square feet inside, it had to sit 60 feet from the adjoining property, maybe 60 feet from the curb, and it had to be a single family dwelling, et cetera, et cetera. All these laws in the United States called zoning laws or zoning ordinances, these laws effectively eliminated the operation of the market. Or if you don't accept that they, uh, uh, that fact that they eliminated the operation market, you'd have to go with the hypothesis that poor people and black people don't live in the suburbs, don't like to live in the suburbs, because they have not inundated the suburbs to the extent that they've inundated the cities. Now, so to kind of recap, the collective conspiracy hypothesis ignores the fact that of conflicting goals, and the attainment of one person's goal may make impossible the attainment of another person's goal. Now, 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 some of you, before I start talking about another hypothesis, you know, what does discrimination do? Um, some of you might be saying, because, you know, libertarians are moral people, and you look like a bunch of moral people. Uh, you might say, well, is it fair for some people to have to pay a higher price for what they buy? That is, is it fair uh, for a black to have to pay $60,000 for a house uh, and a white pay $40,000 for a house? Or is it fair that a whole building uh, is rented to a white family for a lower price than it's rented to a black family? Well, economic theory can't tell us what's fair. Everybody has their opinion on what's fair. But economic theory can predict the consequences of not allowing some people to pay higher prices for what they buy, and, or, and it can predict the consequences of not allowing some people to uh, uh, receive lower prices for what they sell. And you can see this if I ask you the following question. Suppose you see a fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man married to a beautiful young lady. What kind of prediction would you make about that man's income? <laughs> you, would, you would guess that it's fairly high, wouldn't you? And, and so what is the fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man doing? He's saying to the beautiful young lady, look, I can't compete for your hand on the basis of a guy like Williams. So, I'm, <laughs> so he says... So he's saying, he's, he's saying that I'm going to offset my non-pecuniary disabilities or disadvantages by offering you a higher price. Now, some of you might say, well, is it fair? Is it fair for beautiful young ladies to charge fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking men <laughs> higher prices than handsome men? And then having maybe reached the conclusion that it's not fair, you say, well, we'll make a law. That beautiful young ladies, the unequal opportunity law, if you will, that beautiful young ladies are going to, can't charge fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking men higher prices than they charge handsome men. Then having made that law and enforcing that law, then ask yourself, what then happens to the probability of a fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man marrying a beautiful young lady? It goes, in fact, it goes almost to zero, unless you find some kind-hearted, uh, beautiful young lady. 
That is, by denying that man the opportunity to offer a higher price for what he buys, you deny him his most effective mechanism for competing with the more preferred individual. So, an economic prediction would be is that if you don't allow people to charge uh, higher prices, uh, uh, charge lower price for what they sell or pay higher price for what they buy, you reinforce some of their handicaps. <clears throat> now, what about discrimination? Sexual discrimination if we're talking about women or racial discrimination if you're talking about blacks. People say, well, it's racial discrimination that is the villain of the piece. Well, trying to explain things through uh, racial discrimination is like trying to explain fires through oxygen. That is, if you ask me, well, Williams, what was the cause of the Grand Hotel fire in Las Vegas several years ago that a lot of people lost their lives in? And I say to you, well, that fire was caused by oxygen. Well, some of you might snicker. And then I say to you, well, look, had there not been oxygen, that wouldn't, there would not have been a fire. Uh, how do you like that? Well, what's wrong with explaining the Grand Hotel fire by saying that it was caused by oxygen? Well, what I think is wrong is that oxygen is so pervasive that is, oxygen is everywhere, that it alone just cannot explain anything. That is, uh, if you say that the Grand Hotel fire was caused by oxygen, well, you're hard put for explaining why the Los Angeles Hilton did not also burn down that night, because it too was surrounded by oxygen. So oxygen alone just cannot explain anything. Now, <clears throat> discrimination of all forms is so pervasive that it alone cannot explain anything. They're all forms of discrimination. Um, there's a, a sex discrimination, race discrimination, height discrimination, uh, weight discrimination. You know, if you're five feet five, forget about becoming the President of the United States because we do not elect runts to office. We discriminate <laughs> against runts or try to be a general, or try to be an executive of a major organization. They just don't have little teeny people uh, as, as in these positions. We discriminate against them. There's movie discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. We discriminate. Matter of fact, uh, discrimination can be best described as the act of choice. And economic scarcity requires that we all make choices, and discrimination is a choice. And when you preface discrimination with words like uh, sexual or race, you're just specify, specifying the criteria upon which we choose. Uh, and there's all kinds, as I said, all kinds of discrimination. You know, like when I was, when I was choosing a wife to marry, I discriminated against other women. And uh, a matter of fact, the law requires that I continue to discriminate, uh, even though I might not <laughs> feel like it all the time. And some of you might say, well, well, Williams, you're really being absurd because that kind of discrimination doesn't hurt anybody. Well, I would be take offense at that kind of observation. Uh, uh, the only way that uh, uh, I could not have hurt somebody by discriminating in favor of my wife was to be the kind of man that only one woman would want. And that's obviously not the case. Okay, so, but, but some of the evidence uh, of a racial discrimination, you know, if you, uh, my colleague Tom, my colleague and good, very good friend Tom Sowell, he's done a lot of uh, uh, analysis, and he points out that well, the Jews have faced a history of discrimination, but in the places where they're discriminated against, they tend to have the higher incomes. Or Armenians in the post-Ottoman Empire, uh, they tend to have the higher incomes. Or Japanese Americans, according to 1980 census, had the highest family income in the United States, and Japanese were discriminated against. They were interned during the Second World War. Uh, the Chinese in Southeast Asia are discriminated against. They face massive expulsions and massacres in the past, but yet they have the highest income. In some of the countries in Southeast Asia, while Chinese are tiny minorities, they control 60, 40 to 60 percent of the GNP, uh, or they produce 40 to 60 percent of the GNP every year. So, and, and, or, and in the United States, uh, West Indian American blacks they have a higher median income than the average white. 
in the United States. So if discrimination could explain all that people say it explains, well, how come you have these groups that are uh, 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 so successful economically? Now, furthermore, I think when, you are, when people argue with you saying that discrimination explains things like the fact that women get lower pay, the 59% of male income, well, these people would have you believe that, uh, uh, you know, when people say that women get 59% for doing the same uh, work that men do, well, these people would have you believe that a, an entrepreneur in a competitive environment could survive paying costs that are 70% higher than he otherwise have to pay. That is, uh, a slow-witted minority or slow-witted uh, entrepreneur could come into business and drive his competition out by uh, 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 paying 70% uh, the lower cost. He'd just hire women and drive all his competition out of the market. And so uh, that person who would have us believe that kind of stuff uh, uh, requires that uh, we believe uh, that in a competitive market people could survive with such higher paying uh, uh, costs that are much higher than they uh, need pay. That is, people have got, companies have gone out of business uh, paying 1% uh, higher costs than their uh, competition. Okay, so since I said that discrimination doesn't explain it, uh, collective conspiracies, preferences, good and evil. Well, what might explain some of the problems that uh, uh, so-called minorities face, or blacks face in the United States, or West Indians in, uh, in England, and other people around the world? Well, I believe that it has to do with the rules of the game. We have to pay greater attention to the rules of the game. Uh, and we have to recognize that the rules of the game determine the outcome of the game. That is, if you can write the rules of the game, you can manipulate the outcome of the game. Uh, now, the rules of the game are often ignored by people. And let me give you an idea or, or an example of the rules of the game that influence the outcome of the game. And I've been criticized for giving this example, but since I have such a rich physical endowment, I continue to give the, uh, give the example despite the uh, uh, criticism. It's, it's probably a correct assertion that if you went around the world, you could not find five females that could beat the Los Angeles Lakers in a game of basketball. I don't care what the Supreme Court said about women's equality and things like that. That's probably a correct assertion. Now, why? Well, some of you might say, well, the reason is that uh, men are faster than women or men are taller than women, men have more upper body strength than women, men run backwards faster than women, and things like that. Well, you'd be wrong if you gave those kind of uh, answers. It has to do with the rules of the game, or basketball law. Uh, and you can see this if you say, Williams, we appoint you commissioner of basketball, and we give you power to write basketball law, and we want you to write, power, we want you to write basketball law in such a way that you rig the game of basketball in favor of women. We want women to win more often. It'd be very easy. i make a few minor changes in basketball law. That is, the game would have to be played in high heel shoes. <laughs> or, or, and you can see Jabbar running down the court in high heel shoes. <laughs> or, or, or you had to knit a tiny doily before you go on a fast break or something like that. And by just changing the rules of the game somewhat, you can alter the outcome or the makeup of the winners. Uh, and probably if you got slick enough, you could make it almost impossible for men to win just by altering the rules of the game. I believe if I know my history of golf uh, uh, at all, that uh, women used to win quite often in, in golf. And I believe it, it was some king or some prince, either in Spain or in England, he changed the rules of the game. He made the distance between the holes longer. And, and where strength played a greater role in one's success at golf. And so men started winning all the time. I mean, it was just clear that women just could not drive a ball as far as men on average. So just by changing the rules of the game, they changed the composition of the winners. Now, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, 
or specify a few uh, rules of the game that I've gotten some notoriety in different places around the world and in my own country talking about. One, I'll just mention very briefly because you're familiar with it, is the minimum wage law. The minimum wage law changed the rules of the game in a way that uh, adversely impacts on, on uh, people with certain uh, characteristics. But I might mention before I say, uh, go and delve into the minimum wage law just a little bit, because most of you have probably read about it, um, that the essential feature of the rules of the game that hurt blacks, or hurt minorities, I'm going to use that terminology, is that the, the basic feature of these rules of the game is that they deny people the opportunity to engage in voluntary exchange. Or they prevent people uh, from making compensating differences, like the fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man. Uh, he was making compensating differences when he paid higher prices for the uh, hand of the uh, beautiful young lady. Now, the minimum wage law is just like that. It prevents people from making compensating differences. It prevents people from working at a price that will enable them to get uh, employment. It's like steak. You know, how does Chuck Steak manage to sell uh, uh, sell at a greater volume than uh, filet mignon? It offers people compensating differences. But however, if you were to make a minimum steak law saying that uh, uh, filet mignon and chuck steak had to sell for uh, two pounds a pound, then people would discriminate against chuck steak. That is, the cost of discriminating against the less preferred cut would be zero. And whenever you went to the supermarket, what would you see on the shelves? You would see chuck steak. It would be unemployed. That is, people would uh, uh, indulge their preferences. Now, the effect of the minimum wage law, in the United States currently, the minimum wage is $3.35 an hour, plus there's some mandated fringes, such as Social Security and other kinds of uh, um, uh, fringes, which you're really talking about $4 an hour. But if you have a law that says, mandates that you pay, no matter who you hire, $3.35 an hour, employers are not going to find it in their economic interest to hire somebody who's so unfortunate so that his output is only worth $2 an hour. It's a losing economic proposition. So that person does not uh, get employed. And who are those people who are low skilled, who might only be able to produce $2 an hour worth of goods and services? Well, for the most part, they're teenagers. And teenagers low skilled because they lack the experience um, and maturity and other characteristics of adults. So economic theory would predict that the minimum wage law would discriminate against the employment of low skilled people. And the evidence for this is to go to the unemployment statistics. In the United States, unemployment currently for uh, people 25 years and over is something like 5.5%. Uh, uh, unemployment for teenagers uh, in general is around 22%. Unemployment for black teenagers is around uh, 45, down from 50 some uh, percent. Now, most people are aware of the current uh, statistics, of these current numbers, but they're not aware of the unemployment uh, at earlier times. Back in 1948, uh, which, is one of the, which is the beginning year that I used for my report that I gave the Joint Economic Committee, uh, black <coughs> teenage unemployment was less than that of white teenage unemployment. It uh, was either equal to or less than that. And surely since 1948 in the United States, you cannot explain the uh, uh, deteriorating labor market conditions of black teenagers relative to white teenagers by saying that there's more racial discrimination today in the United States than there was in 1948. You can't explain it by saying, well, blacks had more education than whites in 1948. You can't even blame it on the economic cycle. Uh, it turns out that a major villain of the piece is the minimum wage law uh, coupled with other labor laws. Now, the, the minimum wage law has been used uh, by many around the world to foster racial discrimination in employment. In fact, as uh, Leon mentioned, when I, during my visit to South Africa, one of the major supporters of the minimum wage law 
and equal pay for equal work laws, they call it rate for the job law in South Africa, was uh, white racist unions there that would never have a black in their union. And their stated purpose behind their support for minimum wage law was something like the following. A, a fellow named Birke, I believe, uh, of the uh, construction union, uh, he said that to see whites in res residential construction is becoming more and more rare. And he says that the government is no longer protecting the white worker from competition with the black worker. And they said that in order to ensure the economic welfare of white workers, we need minimum wage laws or equal pay for equal work laws. And they made it very clear that uh, uh, they were not doing it for the blacks. They were doing it to protect white workers from uh, black competition. Now, of course, in the United States and other places around the world, uh, the stated motivation behind support for the minimum wage law uh, has, it was more noble. They say that, well, we're doing it in the interest of the poor. We want to help the poor. Well, intentions just don't explain very much of human behavior. Uh, that is, uh, the effect of human behavior uh, does not depend on the intentions that underlie human behavior. And it turns out in both places, the United States and South Africa, the, the uh, effect of these uh, 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 laws that fix price is to cause unemployment for the least skilled worker, whether it's in uh, South Africa or United States, or whether it's in uh, Great Britain or United States. The effect of the law is to cause unemployment for the least skilled uh, worker. Um, well, you might want to ask some questions about that. But let me <coughs> go into some other areas. Um, I might also add one of the things about the minimum wage law is that it destroys certain jobs. Uh, one of the re rather remarkable things that I observed in South Africa was the, that uh, during the two months stay there, we didn't have any, tr any trouble in South Africa, by the way, uh, because we were we had uh, what Leon refers to as diplomatic immunity, but to which I refer to as, uh, you know, we were just honorary white people uh, <laughs> for, for two months, only for two months. I don't believe they make it that much longer. But um, in South Africa, we did not have the occasion to eat out of plastic dishes or, or any kind of plastic uh, utensils. Now, I'm sure that the reason why we did not uh, eat from plastic in South Africa was not because the South Africans had not discovered plastic. The reason was is that the labor costs were relatively low in South Africa and it made sense to wash dishes and, uh, and to use labor to wash dishes. But in the United States, labor costs are so high that we uh, <clears throat> don't use it to wash dishes. We have dishwashing machines. Uh, so the minimum wage law destroys certain jobs, and it doesn't allow certain jobs to be born in the first place. Um, I'll give you another example. In the United States, uh, at least when I was a kid, when you go to the neighborhood movie, you would see two or three ushers to show you to your seat. Today, even in the best of downtown theaters, there might be one usher. Now, you surely can't explain the demise of ushers uh, over the last 40 or 50 years by saying that Americans of 1984 like to stumble down the aisles in the dark to find their seats. <laughs> it's the minimum wage law has destroyed that kind of job. Uh, the Western Union uh, uh, job where boys used to deliver Western Unions on bicycles and destroy that kind of job. So the minimum wage law destroys uh, 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 jobs uh, and it doesn't cause certain jobs to be born. Now, there are other laws and regulations that uh, uh, handicap people. One that I've just done uh, um, a lot of research on, and, you, and some of it's cited in my book that I, I'm, uh, Chris Tame says is on sale here. Uh, you should buy many copies and give to your friends, all, all in the social interest. Um, but occupational and business licensing laws. In the United States, uh, one that I've talked about is the tax cab industry, where uh, one, in order to own and operate a taxi in New York City, you have to go out and buy a $65,000 license. In, in Chicago, it's 40000 
In Miami, 35,000. In Philadelphia, uh, my city, it's uh, 20,000 down from 33,000. Now, the, you ask yourself, well, what is the effect of a law that generates a $65,000 license price? Well, that law tends to discriminate against poor people getting in the cab business because poor people don't usually have $65,000 laying around, nor do they have bank credit that will enable them to get a $65,000 loan. Now, in some of these cities, blacks own very few of the cabs. In Philadelphia, blacks own 3% of the taxis, and Philadelphia is a city that's 40% black. But if you go to Washington, D.C., it turns out that uh, 70 to 80 percent of the taxis in Washington, D.C. are owned by blacks. Um, and you might say, well, why does this guy say, you know, how come he can't be more precise since he's a prof professor? Uh, you know, how come he can't come up and say 76 percent? Well, it turns out that when my research assistant and I were doing the study, we went to the files and we could tell race by the pictures because the pictures were next to the uh, licenses in Washington, and some of the guys looked kind of shaky. We could tell definitely that 70% of them were black, but some of them had some uh, mixed ancestry, uh, and so we weren't that sure, so we used a little fudge factor. But you say, well, well how come they have, you know, how come so many blacks own uh, taxes in Washington, D.C., as opposed to other cities? Do you say, according to the racial discrimination hypothesis, well, there's no racial discrimination in Washington. That's what explains it. No, that doesn't explain it at all. <laughs> it turns out in Washington, D.C. that the license to own and operate a taxi is under $100. And $100 differs significantly uh, from $65,000. Furthermore, uh, as a result of having an open market in Washington, D.C., many people benefit. That is, Washington has the highest quality cab service of any city in the United States if you measure quality by the number of taxes per thousand of the population. It has 12.1 taxes per 1,000 population. New York has 2.4 taxes per 1,000 population. Philadelphia has a third of a taxi per 1,000 population. Furthermore, in Washington, D.C., taxi prices are among the lowest uh, in the United States. Now, but I might mention, just as a, a, a conclusion to uh, things I'm going to say about taxis, is that you shouldn't think of licensing necessarily as a racial phenomenon, even though it may have some racial aspects, because while I was doing the, the study of the tax cab industry, when I jumped in the cab, I would try to get some anecdotal stuff, and I'd strike up a conversation with the driver. And, um, and one time I landed at D.C. National Airport, and a black driver picked me up, and I said to him, uh, uh, gee, you guys are lucky in Washington, D.C. You don't have to go out and buy a $65,000 license in order to uh, be in business. And he said to me, well, we've been trying to get a, the medallion system or licensing system here, uh, but Congress won't go along with it. The Congress controls Washington, D.C. And so he said to me, he says, as it is, you know, it's so cheap to get into business that we have these damn Pakistanis coming in and the West Indians and, <laughs> and Arabs and everybody else horning in on our business. So I say that to point out to you that it's not an issue of race. It's more of an issue of the ins versus the outs. And the ins want a mechanism to keep the outs out so that they can charge us higher prices and earn higher income and uh, higher wages, higher profits. So it's not, so, so if you're trying to deregulate the cab industry, let's say in London, you wouldn't try to, or, you wouldn't try to organize any black uh, 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 cab drivers. Not, I'm not talking about the, uh, I mean black ra racially. Or you wouldn't want to organize the minority cab drivers because they're in and they have the same vested interest as the uh, as uh, as as white drivers. That is, everybody likes monopoly, and monopoly is okay so long as you don't use government to enforce monopoly. In my opinion, I mean, everybody likes monopoly because th th that's what marriage is, isn't it? I mean, that's the light marriage license is monopoly. And, you know, like a lot of people say to me, and I, I look at them, they say, gee, he wasn't like that before we got married. He was open corridors. Well, of course he was a little more efficient because he was competing. But, but once you get married, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Once you get married, there's less competition, supposedly, anyway, and, uh, and so you run into all kinds of inefficiencies associated with uh, uh, monopoly.
so, uh, but people have the right to form those kind of monopolies so long as they're voluntary, in my opinion. Okay, let me just kind of finish up, because uh, I'm sure there's some <coughs> questions. I don't want to outdo my time. Um, in the United States, there are roughly uh, 900 licensing laws, licensing 900 different occupations. And there are well over 3,000 licensing jurisdictions. And they license things from cosmetology to uh, barbering, uh, landscaping, lightning rod installers, auctioneers, fortune tellers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, which is not to exclude things like doctors, lawyers, architects, electricians, plumbers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the basic effect of these licensing laws is that of excluding entry and making it possible for those who are already in to uh, charge higher prices and uh, earn higher income. A lot of the licensing in the United States indeed was racially motivated. That is, many people do not realize, despite the fact that blacks have a lot of trouble entering the trade constructions right now in the United States, at one time, particularly in the southern United States, blacks dominated the skilled trade, such as uh, uh, bricklayers, carpenters, stonemasons, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and plumbing. And if you read through some of the licensing laws and some of the, the legislative debate behind some of the licensing laws, most notably in the South, uh, the United States, the stated intention of those laws was to get rid of blacks. That is, the whites just could not compete with the cheaper uh, uh, labor services. And blacks did a lot of the construction in the South. The whole cities were built by blacks, particularly during the Reconstruction period. There were uh, uh, eight schools uh, and uh, the market center in Washington, in Washington, D.C., and other important buildings that were built by blacks under black supervision. So how do you explain the fact that blacks aren't very well represented in many trades uh, today? Is it because, well, blacks just go, hey, I'm tired of being a carpenter and just quit en masse? No, it was licensing laws that eliminated them from the trade. So, again, it's rules of the game that uh, determine the uh, outcome of the game. And let me just say a few more things. Uh, do I have about five minutes? A few more things uh, that I think I should say, and this is kind of uh, uh, a little bit disorderly here, but if I don't say them to you, if I don't tell you, you'll just go through the rest of your life not knowing them, and I feel <laughs> somewhat obligated. Uh, a good deal of the problem that we face uh, as people, as human beings in general, indeed has to do with race and sex. Because I think that black people, or racial minorities, if you want to use that terminology, and women are used as cannon fodder for those who want more state control. Because after all, when people argue for more government control, what are they really, what are they saying, what are they saying? They're saying, well, we need to help the blacks. We're doing this, we're gonna control rents because we wanna help blacks. We want a minimum wage law because we wanna help blacks. We want equal pay for equal work laws because we wanna help women, et cetera, et cetera. And what they really wanna do, they wanna help themselves. And, but they're using the, some of the problems of women and the problems of minorities as entry points to get greater control over our lives. And I think that as libertarians, we need to debunk a lot of the mythology that's, um, uh, that's, that's, that's used to, uh, uh, to further these people's ends. Because after all, I believe that most human beings, most human beings are decent people. And that they are indeed concerned about the problems that blacks or women might face. And they fall easy prey to charlatans and quacks offering easy solutions. And I think part of the problem has to do with the terminology that we even use. And I just want to comment on I, I, want, I, I don't want us to use the language of our enemy. That is, uh, we have confusing terminology, like they say, well, we want more government intervention to integrate the schools or to end segregation in schools. Well, a word like segregation 
and so far our schools in the United States today is inappropriately applied. And because what people do, they, they shift the definitions of terms when they go to one subject to another. Let me give you just a brief uh, explanation. If I were to ask the average American, um, <clears throat> or ask the average Londoner, uh, or average Briton, um, are, the, are the water fountains at the D.C., Washington, D.C. National Airport, have they been desegregated? Yeah, at one time, blacks weren't allowed, not allowed to drink from water fountains in certain places. I say, well, have they been desegregated? I'm quite sure that the average American would say, yes, they have been desegregated. And what would be the test that they would use to determine whether they've been desegregated? They'd just go to the airport and see whether black, if he were in the airport, could drink from the water fountain. But, but when he asked the question, have schools been desegregated in the United States? Well, you get a lot of controversy over that. Some people will say, yes, they have been desegregated, and some people will say, no, they're still segregated. And they want a lot of Supreme Court uh, busing and things like that to desegregate the schools. Well, look what happens to the meaning of segregation and desegregation when you switch from water fountains to schools. That is, nobody in their right mind, when you ask them, have the water fountains at D.C. National Airport, have them been des desegregated? Nobody in their right mind says, well, look, blacks are 70% of the population of Washington, D.C., are 70% of, of the people drinking at the water fountains at any time are they black, and if not, then the water fountains are, are segregated. <laughs> now, but however, they do do that with, with respect to schools. They say, well, blacks are 12% of the population somewhere, and if the school does not have 12% black, then it is segregated, segregated and we need to have busing. Now, the, they, use, they give an operational definition to segregation and desegregation when we're talking about water fountains, and they use a non-operational definition when we talk about schools. They're talking about racial balance and things like this. And because of the sloppy terminology, people come up with sloppy policy. Because nobody in their right mind you know, and, and, you know, it's probably, yeah, you know, I guess when I walked to D.C. National Airport that only 15% of the people drinking water, water at the fountain are black, despite the fact that D.C. is a, a city of 70% black. Now, having observed that, nobody in their right mind would propose busing. That is, to bus whites <laughs> from the airport fountains out to Anacostia and, and bus the blacks from Anacostia out to the uh, uh, D.C. National Airport. But people do do that in schools because they use sloppy definition. I doubt whether in the United States where you can find one public school that does not admit uh, people on racial criteria. Or if there is one, it's just very few. Uh, then let me just fi finally give one other definition because I and, uh, and I don't have really have a nice, very nice conclusion because I'm going over time. But people say. They use the term prejudice. Uh, that prejudice is a problem. Well, I think prejudice is a very, very good word to use when we talk about human relationships, but it's, it, it, we use it incorrectly. Now, uh, when people talk about prejudice, they're typically talk, they're, they're saying, well, prejudice represents you don't like somebody, or things like this, or you use stereotypes. Well, I say, what's wrong with using stereotypes? I think stereotypes are very good. Uh, they convey information. You know, for example, you now some of you might say, well, look, you might say, I'm not prejudiced. But you probably, you either are prejudiced or you're fooled. <laughs> now, you know, when I talk about prejudice, I use this Latin derivative. That means to make decisions on the basis of incomplete information. That is, you prejudge things. You don't wait to get all the information in before you make a decision. And economists can just, can best understand prejudice as those decisions made on the basis of incomplete information. Now, for example, suppose we're getting ready to break in a few minutes, but suppose as you're walking out the back door of this room, as you turn the corner, you see a full-grown lion sitting, sitting there. What would you do? Most people, I would predict, it's an uninteresting prediction, would seek to leave the area in great dispatch, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, why? Is your decision to run based on any detailed information about that particular tiger? Or is it based on tiger folklore? What your friends have told you about tigers? 
how you've seen other tigers behave. You are prejudging that tiger, aren't you? Now, of course, if you were not prejudiced, you would attempt to get some more information about that tiger before you ran. <laughs> you would come up there and pet him on the cheek to establish whether he's dangerous. You know, here, kitty, kitty, and struggling. And then, and only then, if he behaved in a menacing fashion, would you run. But see, most people, they, when they see the tiger there, they make a quick or an instantaneous cost-benefit uh, 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 analysis. They say, they conclude that the cost of an additional unit of information about that tiger far exceeds the benefit. <laughs> and so they don't search anymore. Now, so you, the use of stereotypes and prejudice is a very, very important part of the optimal stock of human uh, decision-making uh, 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 techniques. Now, the same thing with sexual, sexual stereotypes. If I'm going to, you know, the guy say, hey, Williams, uh, um, among this group of nice libertarians, uh, pick a five-person basketball team, and uh, if you win, uh, well, you'll get a million dollars. Well, I mean, I like women. As a matter of fact, some of my best friends are women. <laughs> but I would not pick any of the females here, because I guess I prejudge them as not as being good, uh, not being as good in basketball. Although you could have the Olympic team here that I just don't know of, but on the average, I'm right. Now, so what I'm saying is that prejudging or stereotypes, and this also applies to employment, applies to uh, interest uh, uh, lending, et, et cetera, et cetera, people use these techniques, is I believe the, the, the uh, concept of prejudice as a, uh, is, is misled, I mean, uh, uh, um, is not defined very well, and we shift our meanings on it, and we should have, at least in our own minds when we talk about people, to rec and then we talk to people, we should recognize that these words or these terms are being uh, used inconsistently and perhaps uh, mischievously. Okay, so in conclusion, before you raise some questions, I think that the problems that minorities face is a problem of government intervention. And I believe if as Ronald Reagan says, which he has not done, if, he, if, if government were off our backs, I think we'd have a much better uh, society, and I think, I think that uh, minorities would find uh, greater upward mobility. Thank you very much. We might be near to Greenwich, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should use Greenwich Mean Time. I think we'll use Libertarian Mean Time, which has tended to be somewhat behind Greenwich Mean Time on account, I believe, of the fact that we're west of Greenwich right here, and that makes a lot of sense. So there is time, or I declare using my chairman's prerogative that there's time for discussion and questions, and uh, the... Uh, uh, but, but before doing so, I want to use another, another chairman's prerogative, and that's make another point that is interesting here. In recent years, there have been reforms in South Africa in terms of which blacks are now allowed to enter business freely in so-called black areas, in Soweto. And within three years of being permitted to do that, the Soweto Chamber of Commerce and the National Black Chamber of Commerce is now the most powerful lobby in South Africa for maintaining separate racial group areas in order to keep white traders out of black areas so that uh, it is conspicuously not a case of race but a case of insiders and outsiders or of getting in and slamming the door behind you and this is uh, happening all over the show. Anyway, the one here and then at the back, then Brian and then Dean. In fact, might I ask Walter if you'll just stand here and field the questions yourself. In the United States, uh, there's one case that has been puzzling me. In the nursing profession, 
seems to be low paid and yet they're always crying about a shortage. And have you looked into that uh, for any kind of explanation? Uh, the, the question for those of you that are not here, in the, um, in the nursing uh, profession, it appear in the United States appear to be uh, low paid and they're uh, always uh, talking about shortages. I think that if you're talking about uh, uh, practical nurses, uh, they have recently, over the last 10 years being recent, uh, they've been uh, licensed in the United States, and the licensing has cut off the supply of many, many uh, uh, people. One, I, I'm, I, I'm personally aware of, of one particular case. My wife's uh, uh, sister was a practical nurse for something like 25 years, and then licensing was introduced. And she did not have the education, she didn't graduate from high school, she did not have the education to pass the licensing test. And so her doctor came to her, told her one day she just could not work as a practical nurse anymore. And so now she works as a lab technician, uh, you know, uh, counting and making blood counts and things like this. But she was uh, effectively excluded from uh, being a practical nurse. And I imagine many other people... Uh, of similar backgrounds were excluded uh, from the uh, field of uh, practical nurse by nursing by the uh, uh, licensing laws. What's that? Yeah. Uh, this, this ex explains the uh, shortage, but how does that explain the low wages? I, I think there must be some other kind of intervention causing the low wages. Okay. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether. Well, you know, low wages. We can't speak uh, absolutely. I don't know. I'm, I don't know about the wage structure. But uh, uh, relative to their other alternatives, I think that if I if I have my numbers right, that practical nurses at least make around sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars a year, and a fully licensed registered nurse who let's say who's an OR operating room nurse, you're talking about somebody in their thirties, thirty thousand dollars. So I'm not quite sure what the, that means um, as a wage relative to their other alternatives. I don't know whether that's low or high. Uh, Liam. Yeah, no, I, we have to, uh, we must adjourn now, otherwise we won't have coffee. There is discussion later of Walter's paper, the two Walters, uh, Walter Block after coffee. So I'm going to use the further chairman's prerogative and not proceed with questions. Uh, but what I, in, it remains then for me just to thank Walter Williams uh, for what has been one of the most entertaining thought-provoking and challenging of the papers we've had here. And let me uh, uh, mention, to give you some suggestions as to how to deal with some uh, kinds of prejudice. And that is, uh, I now routinely in South Africa where uh, forms require me to put my race, which they don't require of uh, Washington taxi cab drivers, so Walter had to look at their pictures. Uh, if it says race, I put human. Um, uh, and there are a couple of other nice libertarian answers on official forms. One of them is if, it's, if it asks uh, if you want to have dependents, for example, I put uh, one million pensioners, 300,000 civil servants. Uh, <coughs> uh, and then finally, when I came into the UK, it says their purpose of visit and I routinely put that the purpose of everything I do is to re restore the Habsburgs in Austria. Uh, and uh, I think we libertarians need to have some creative form-filling in approaches, uh, which gradually will undermine the bureaucracy. But now I'm, I learned some of these techniques from Walter, and if you do have the opportunity to talk to him later, ask him about his approach, for example, to military service. Uh, and you'll find that it's creative and very libertarian and very effective. Uh, thank, let's thank him again in the appropriate way for an, an outstanding presentation.